Hi and welcome back. So in this video we're going to be looking at electrolytic cells. This means we're actually going to jump a little bit forward into area of study 2. And this largely is because electrolysis we started to talk about with the recharge of secondary cells. So we're going to continue that idea together and keep our study of cells all combined. So what VCAR wants us to understand for electrolysis is that we need to be able to talk about the electrolysis of molten liquids. So this is where we melt an ionic uh, salt down. Okay, no water is present in a molten liquid. Aqueous solutions as well using different electrodes. So if we change the electrodes around. We need to know the general operating principles of commercial cells, but not again not knowing exact cells. We just need to know the structural features, the idea of selecting suitable electrolytes, the type of electrodes that we would use, and how we would go about desiring, uh, obtaining desired products from suggested ones. We don't need to memorize the cells themselves. We need to be able to use the electrochemical series to predict the products of an electrolysis reaction, which is a critical skill and goes also towards supporting our idea of secondary cells. From that, we need to be able to talk about predicting the half equations and the overall equation for cell reactions, and this includes states. Comparisons between electrolytic cells and with galvanic cells in terms of our energy transformations and the features. And then the last one is the application of stoichiometry and Faraday's laws to determine the amount of products or current at the time. So this is essentially an overview of area of study two. So let's get started. <clears throat> As we've mentioned before, in voltaic cells or galvanic cells, we convert chemical potential energy into electrical energy. This means that when we split those two half cells apart and separate the direct redox re reaction into two half equations, the electrons pass through the wire generating electrical energy. In electric cell, uh, electrolytic cells, we need to harness the electrical energy to produce chemical potential energy. So this is the exact same process you may remember as the recharge process from a secondary cell. We're forcing the non-spontaneous reaction by adding in electrical energy. So we're reversing the spontaneous reaction and instead of releasing energy, we are now putting energy in. This is the endothermic process. If we didn't put the energy in, then we couldn't overcome the activation energy and it would be a non-spontaneous reaction. It wouldn't occur. Because of this, because we are now using reactants in here that are the reactants for a non-spontaneous reaction, they can actually be combined. I don't need to keep them apart in the way that we did with a galvanic cell because these are now the non-spontaneous reactants. If they're all in, the ions are all in solution together, they're not going to react because they can't. That activation energy barrier is too high. So when we see the setup of an electrolytic cell, there's a couple of features that you will notice that are a bit different. We generally typically don't have to have separation. We will have to separate the products. So we do need to separate the products of the electrolytic process, but we don't have to separate the reactants because it's non-spontaneous. And then we will have a power source connected to our external circuit. Okay, the ions that are going to be in, this needs to be either solution or molten so that the ions are able to conduct electricity because remember ionic substances don't conduct in the solid state. So if we have a look at this, we are going to have electrons moving out of the anode. This is where oxidation is still occurring. Remember the reducing agent will be attracted to the anode and then oxidation will occur. But this time, because the electrons are being drawn out, the anode is positive. It is connected to the positive terminal of the battery. The negative terminal of the battery or the power source is connected to the cathode and determines the polarity of the cathode 
being negative. We're pushing electrons into the cathode, which means we have a higher electron density at the cathode here making it negative. This is our source of electrons and remember the source of electrons in any cell is the negative one. So in a galvanic it's the, ano the anode is going to be a negative electrode. In an electrolytic cell the polarity of our electrodes changes. So our cathode is now negative and is the one connected to the negative terminal of the battery. However reduction still occurs here so we'll see reduction at the cathode. So the battery is always going to inform us in an electric cell as to which is the cathode and which is the anode. So the electrode connected to the negative terminal of the power source has the excess electrons and is the negative electrode, will still be the cathode because that is where reduction occurs. The excess electrons flow into the electrolyte. They're gained by the strongest oxidizing agent that is present. Okay and that oxidizing agent is reduced. The flow of ions, the flow of ions in the electrolyte carries the charge. Okay, that's essentially going to form our internal circuit. You'll notice in an electrolytic cell there is no salt bridge. Okay, because we have the one container for the non-spontaneous reaction, there is no salt bridge. The electrode connected to the positive terminal has the electrons taken away from it, so the electron, the reaction there that we want to occur is the one that produces electrons, and that is our oxidation. If we compare the galvanic cell and the electrolytic cell, you can see we can have electrolytic cells that where the half cells are split, this will be much the same as a secondary cell or an accumulator where we can recharge the cell. We can still see those half cells being split because it's still using that galvanic process for the forward reaction. This cadmium copper cell, we can see that we have cadmium solid going to cadmium 2 plus and copper solid. Copper is being reduced, so is our cathode. Cadmium is being oxidized, so this is our anode. So during the galvanic discharge process, we will have electrons flowing through the voltmeter from the anode to the cathode. Okay, positive ions will come out of the salt bridge towards the cathode, and negative ions will come out of the salt bridge towards the anode. The electrolytic cell, we apply power to the system now, so there is a source of power. This must be greater than the voltage that is given out by the original cell. Okay, in order for the electrolysis reaction to occur in the reverse reaction, we must put a voltage in that is greater than the voltage put out by the discharge reaction. Okay, and even though these two are separated, it's not necessary to separate them in an electrolytic cell. So if we compare the cells, both cells have anodes and cathodes. Oxidation and reduction will occur at the corresponding electrodes. So remember anox, so anox is the oxidation at the anode or red cat reduction at the cathode. This holds whether it's electrolytic or galvanic. So we have oxidation occurring at the anode in a galvanic and in an electrolytic, and the corresponding reduction occurring at the cathode in both of these cells as well. The key differences here are the polarity of these electrodes. The polarity swaps in the electrolytic cell between the galvanic from the anode being negative to positive and the cathode being positive to it now being negative, and this is determined by the power pack. Okay, remember that the positive electrode goes to the positive terminal of the battery. The electrons are produced at the anode where they are um, being, there is an electron deficiency at the anode in the electrolytic cell. In the cathode, the electrons are consumed. They are still consumed in the electrolytic cell, but we have an excess of them because they are being forced into the cell by the electrical power source. 
Okay, so in a galvanic cell we have a flow from the electrons flowing from the negative to the positive electrode, from the anode to the cathode, whereas for an electrolytic cell those electrons are being forced in from the external power source and they go from positive to negative. Okay, so they flow out of the negative terminal of the battery into the cathode, around, up and into the anode. So we said before we mentioned that we need to have the ionic solids as aqueous or molten salts. You may remember when we looked on the electrochemical series that water also appears on that. So the electrolytic products that we get will differ for some compounds depending on whether or not water is present. For metals such as sodium or potassium, as long as water is present, we will never be able to produce the metal. So these metals are often produced by electrolysis industrially. And if we look at the re reaction for sodium chloride, we will see <clears throat> this is molten NaCl. So this will be hot above a thousand degrees. All we have in here is Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. We have melted the salt. If we connect this to a power pack, Okay, so we're going to connect this to our power pack, long for the positive, short for the negative. Now we can see that the electrons will flow this way, giving us the excess of electrons here, so this is our cathode. Chlorine can't be reduced, it already has its electrons, so it is only sodium that is the only oxidant present. Okay, this is the only oxidant present, which means it will be the strongest oxidant present, so it will be reduced, and we will have sodium forming sodium metal at the electrode. This will be a liquid because if it's hot enough to produce uh, molten salt, it will the sodium will melt. In the case of the chlorine, the chlorine anions will migrate towards the positive electrode and we will see chlorine gas being produced. Remembering that these cells, we will need to be able to pull away the chlorine gas from this because chlorine gas is toxic. Okay, and that's a safety consideration that we have here. Also, these are often done with a barrier over the top because as sodium metal forms, remembering we want to keep it away from the air and water as well. In order to put this in, if you have a look at your electrochemical series and find the reaction for sodium, which will be down towards the bottom, and then your chlorine, which is up towards the top, when we calculate the when we calculate the E0 for this cell, you will find it is around 4 volts, and we will need to exceed the E0 of that cell to force the endothermic non-spontaneous reaction to occur. We will produce sodium and it will actually be liquid in this. We'll need to remove it from the heating in order for it to be a solid and then chlorine gas bubbles will appear at the anode. Again, this is another type of cell. You will often see them with a switch placed in here, which is indicating that the one, when you close this switch, this circuit closes. So we will have the negative polarity of our power source, the positive polarity of our power source. Now you can see here with this one, we have graphite electrodes, which are inert. You often see graphite being used in electrolytic cells, particularly with molten salts. This has the molten salt of zinc chloride. So Zn2 plus is our only oxidant present. It will be reduced to Zn. And then again, Cl minus will be oxidized to Cl2 gas. So the long arm of the positive of the battery symbol indicates the positive. It's long enough for us to be able to rip it in two and make a positive sign. The small arm, that's our negative sign, is the negative. If you have a look, I'd like you to pause the video and calculate what the minimum voltage would be to cause the electrolysis of this particular salt. Remember to find your zinc and chlorine half equations and calculate the or E naught of the cell. So hopefully you looked up your electrochemical series and you found that the Cl minus, sorry, the Cl2 plus two electrons going to Cl2 Cl minus is around 
one positive 1.36 and then the zinc going from Zn2 plus plus two electrons is negative 0 0.763 so if we calculate the E naught for that we will have 1.36 plus 0 0.763 so we will get an overall voltage of approximately 2.12 volts now this is the voltage that must be exceeded okay if we put in just 2.12 volts we won't see the reaction occurring it needs to be greater than 2.12 volts when we write our answer so we want to calculate the voltage of the cell and then specify that for the electrolytic reaction to occur the reverse reaction because what we calculate is the e naught of the forward one then it needs to exceed that voltage in order for the reaction to occur Okay, this is an example question. I want you to read this question, then pause the video, have a go at doing it, and then come back for the answer. You're going to draw an electrolytic cell, remembering that electrolytic cells are only in one container. We don't separate the half reactions. And this is for the electrolysis of molten potassium bromide. Again, this means that your KCl will be liquid because it is molten. There is no other reductants or oxidants present you are just going to have the k plus liquid and cl minus liquid present in your electrode from this you will identify the anode and the cathode the polarity of the electrodes don't forget to include your power pack in your cell diagram the oxidation reduction reactions identify your oxidizing reagent and then the overall equation representing the cell reaction so see how you go with that. Draw a simple diagram. Remember to label everything and come back and check your answer. Okay, hopefully you had a go at this um, and let's have a look at the solution. So you can see here from this diagram we have the single container with the two electrodes. These are electrodes are inert. We are not using the metal electrodes in molten salts. The temperatures are going to be too high and our metals will probably melt. So we're going to use graphite which has a high melting point. So we use graphite because if it's very high melting point, remembering over well over 1800 upwards uh, degrees so it's not going to melt and it's inert. It will not compete at the electrodes. It's not going to be an oxidant or a reductant. Our electrolyte contains our potassium bromide ions. Looking at our equations from the electrochemical series, we have the potassium plus electron being reduced to potassium liquid, Br2 plus two electrons being two Br minus. Now we have Br minus present in our cell and we have K plus present in our cell. Remembering to arrange these in a way that puts them from the most positive to the lowest, this would give us this equation. And we can see here that we have a positive gradient. This positive gradient is opposite to what we see when we're predicting the galvanic process because we're forcing the reverse reaction. So this time round, where with the galvanic, we were looking for it to be a clockwise for the spontaneous reaction. Now, what we're actually seeing is the Br minus around this way. So what we will have now is Br minus reacting. We will see the reverse reaction. Then the bottom reaction is the one that we see the forward reaction on, okay? With a positive gradient from left to right, what we're looking for for the electrolysis. Once we work that out, we will see that we have potassium being reduced to potassium metal will be our reduction reaction at the cathode, which is negative. K plus being the oxidizing agent, K plus liquid, and then Br minus is going to be the reducing agent, and we're going to have Br minus being oxidized to Br2 liquid at the electrode. Bromine is a brown liquid, so we would visually see this being produced at the electrode. That's it for this electrolysis video. Of course, we'll have a lot of practice on questions in class, and I'll see you then.